Hi all, uh, this is Vatsal Shah again. People who have not uh, joined the first session, welcome. Right now, uh, we are more than 120 people live in this meetup, VSF meetup, first version of India. And now I will have a privilege to introduce Philip. Uh, he's from Poland and he's a CTO and co-founder of U Storefront. He is JavaScript developer by heart and he loves uh, front-end technologies. And he's going to talk about number one headless PWA for e-commerce, which is view storefront and then uh, uh, the next level of view storefront rather so uh, and at the end of his session he's an interesting announcement to make so please uh, make sure that you listen and ask right questions to him hey, philip over to you okay hey hey guys hey everyone so let me start okay so first of all i want to thank our allies for organizing this event this is super super cool that we are at the stage where we were able to have such a great event organized by you. And I must say everything is top notch, really like preparation, uh, organization. And also I see that we have a lot of people in here. So also, hello everyone. So my name is Philip. Uh, as I was introduced, I'm CTO and co-founder of Vistorefront. And today I want to talk about Vistorefront Next. So this is a new effort that we are making it's kind of like a new version of Vistorefront, and we been working on this for almost a year already, or even slightly longer than a year. So you could ask actually why we even decided to create Vistorefront next. Does it mean that you know the current version of Vistorefront, Vistorefront one, is bad? And I just want to make things clear: we don't think Vistorefront is bad at all. I mean, the first version. It's a great product. It was, I think, one of the biggest innovations in headless e-commerce space, like three years ago. Uh, but during this time, headless commerce matured as well. Uh, and new technologies and standards are are racing right now. And you know, we no longer have to educate about headless commerce. If you work in this sector, you know that last years were mostly about educating people what it is, how it works. So there are the benefits, and right now we really see that uh, actually this is becoming a standard. Yes, so we wanted to create a framework that is aligned with the current standards, and also after three years of working with the storefront, we know much better how it's being used, what our users are asking for, what they are struggling with, and you know what could be improved. So we took all of that feedback and knowledge and we decided to create a best of breed headless e-commerce framework. And you know, with more than 300 live shops right now that are live, we really have enough knowledge to build a framework that is optimized for things that matter most in headless commerce space. Uh, so we wanted to create a framework that allows us to actually create stunning front ends in recourse time. So have a very slick time to market that performs very well in every, even advanced projects. So no matter if you have a simple shop or super advanced project, it should still uh, work possibly fast. Of course, like the more features you have, uh, the more JavaScript you have to ship, but we'll deal with that uh, a little bit later. And we also wanted uh, to build a framework that helps our clients you know, to innovate by being flexible enough to fulfill even the craziest ideas. So to achieve that, we have listed the key characteristics that we saw next should have to be optimized for those metrics. So one of the most important ones is simplicity. So I really think, and we all think in Vistar from that e-commerce space right now is super, super complicated, but there's light in a tunnel because there are a lot of repetitive patterns, actually, just not everyone are using them, ready to grab that can be used to make it simpler. Mm. And this is exactly what we are doing. So you will see later that we mapped the whole e-commerce domain with just 15 functions. And we also wanted to start from next to be maintainable. So we are aware that updates and you know lack of this high level modularity are probably the biggest issues of current version. So with Vista Front Next, you're being, building on top of Nudge.js, and that's the most important part. And using only as much Vista Front as you need. So you can always get rid of parts of it or even like whole view storefront if you want to. Uh, so this is purely additive to your project. And the API surface is small and not tied to implementation details. So you know every time you have to update, the update should be a matter of hours instead of weeks, uh, like it is right now. 
And also we wanted to make it opinionated. Uh, so there are clear ways of solving certain problems. So if you follow these ways, you can be sure that your application perform well and your code also will remain maintainable. So like these are the foundations we'll be building upon. And now let's talk how we're achieving these goals. So let's talk about flexibility first. I think it was essential for us to have small and self-explanatory API layer because this is what contributes to this the most. And composition API from V3 become a very powerful tool that actually helped us to achieve those goals. So if you don't know uh, what composition API is, it's a new API from V3 that is also ported back to V2 via plugin. And it's actually a new way of interacting with comp components in, with in Vue.js uh, properties. So in Vue 2, you have something uh, called options API. So each component uh, is being built from different options, like you know, data, computed, methods, watch, etc., grouped in an object. And the composition API is doing exactly the same thing, but it is exposing the same functionalities, so the same options as functions. So as you can see on this, uh, on this uh, code snippet, we are importing computed as a function. We are importing ref, which is Kind of like equivalent of data as a function uh, so we can because of that we can import them outside of a view components like in this example and it allows us to externalize some functionality so we don't have to have everything related to vjs in a component we can have different functions that are still utilizing vjs and then we can compose our components from these functions so it is allowing us to maintain our code much easier and with Composition API, you have a new function in a com in component uh, object called setup. And everything that is returned by this function is available in the template. So the same way it was you know, with data. Everything that we have, we've been putting in data was available in the template. Everything we've been putting in methods was available in the template. So it works exactly the same way, except we are returning this explicitly. And this is also great because it allows much better task with experience and it's much more uh, obvious to newcomers what we are returning to the template. And in this example, we're using use product composable, so composition API function on the right side, which is taking care of fetching the product. And with just a single line uh, on the left side in a component, we're making use of it. And Vue is actually being built with these composables. So believe me or not, but this 15 functions are all you have to learn to work confidently with Vue Storefront Next. And I think I don't even have to explain what they do because you know the names are pretty self-explanatory. That was that was one of our goals, yes, to cover a complex e-commerce domain with something relatively simple. So no matter what e-commerce platform you're using, you will always have the same composables, they will always have the same interfaces. So it is still like backend agnostic, uh, just like uh, Vue Storefront 1 was. And let's break this component, this, this composable, this whole composable uh, from we store from down. So each of them have a very similar interface. And here we have an example of use product composable, which is responsible for fetching products and is mainly used in a product page, as the name could suggest. So the most important part of each v store from composable is so-called main data object. And it is keeping basically the state of a composable because they are also managing their own state. And in that case, it's a list of products with some additional metadata, for example, like the count of these products and stuff like this. It's basically a response from your e-commerce platform in the data format of your e-commerce platform. Uh, but this response has to be fetched somehow first, yes. So this is why we also need a function that does that. And in all components, it's either search or load function. So this is populating this main data object. In this case, we see that whenever we invoke search, uh, the products object be is becoming populated. Each composable also has additional reactive properties that indicate you know, loading and error states. And this is super, super useful in the UI, as you can see in this example. So basically, you can just put a bunch of ifs uh, in your template uh, based on the composable state, and it will show you the proper part of the UI. And you know, other composables look more or less the same, and it's also intuitive to know for what feature you should use which composable. And 
I said that this sort of text is super simple and I really meant that. And I could have just finished my presentation here after eight minutes. Uh, but if we have more time, let's dig a little bit deeper and also learn how it works. So you not only know how to use it, but you also learn uh, how it works. So when you're invoking the search method from Composable, uh, it always invokes a special function from another layer of the application under the hood. And this another layer of application is called API client. And in API client, we have a very atomic method that is responsible for fetching uh, different uh, entities, or like I would say, interacting with uh, atomic parts of, uh, <clears throat> of your e-commerce application. So you're able to get a product, to create a card, uh, to add product to the card, stuff like this. Uh, and this API client is the only layer that talks to e-commerce platform. So your composable is talking to API client, API client is talking to e-commerce platform. And this is how it works. And as I said, like the API client is containing different functions. Uh, but this is a layer that you usually don't touch. So you're usually working with composables. This is just a <clears throat> thing that is under the hood of composables. And composables are always the same for the integration, which is super important. So uh, let's say you have a Shopify integration. In Shopify integration, you, can, you could have a bunch of API client functions. Uh, then you have commercial integration. This integration would have absolutely different set of functions in the API client, but all of them are having the same composable. So this is actually the layer that is backend agnostic. Uh, okay, so why actually I'm even mentioning to you uh, about this API client, if this is not an API uh, you will work with, because you will work with composables. So bear with me, you will learn why very soon. Uh, now let's see how a real world application look like from the architectural standpoint, uh, including this API client and how it could evolve uh, to see how flexible this storefront can be with this concept. So let's say we have just started our new Shopify project, headless Shopify project. And the only platform that we're using right now is Shopify and we're totally happy with its capabilities. So with a CMS, with a search mechanism, uh, actually everything that is out of the box with Shopify is enough for us. Uh, so on the front end, we're using composables that are populated with the data from Shopify API client. And at some point, we see that our product catalog has grown significantly and we need a better search functionality for our users. So we are installing Algolia integration and we are still using exactly the same composable on the front end. Nothing has changed. Uh, the only difference is that now the use facet is being populated with the data by Algol Algolia API client. So now our search is handled by Algolia. And in the meantime, you know, content became much more important to our marketing team. And we need to replace Shopify CMS with something more sophisticated with a headless one like Storyblock. In that case, we are just adding Storyblock integration and use content uh, and use, use content composable uh, that is now fetching the data from Storyblock. And again, like front end layer remains the same. We are still using the same composables. So, you know, your business is growing and changing. And what is a good solution today could not be one tomorrow. This is the beauty of headless commerce. We have a bunch of different services that we can make use of. And that actually uh, our platform could have grown, our business could have grown, and then we, we have to replace them. Uh, so that's actually the reason why we're having this huge shift in threadless commerce, yes? So this is why it was crucial for us to make it easy to test new technologies, to adjust your technological stack to the requirements of your business. And, you know, if you choose this storefront, you can actually be sure that your e-commerce will be able to grow with business and adjust to its needs. So that that would cover like the flexibility part, flexibility part and time to market. Uh, okay, so what about performance? It's especially important topic now that we know that from, I think, May, Core Web Vitals will be an important SEO factor. And I see that many people are panicking actually about this. Uh, so before I tell you how we are dealing with that in the storefront, let's deal with a, a huge misconception that for some reason is true. And it's true for majority of single page applications, uh, e-commerce as well. 
even though this is like really, really, really huge misconception. So for some reason, people think that if you are building front-end applications, SPA applications, it means that you should ship all the code to the front-end. And you know, like the recommended overall maximum critical path asset size, critical path uh, is like the minimum required uh, code uh, for your application to work. So the recommended overall maximum critical path asset size is 170 kilobytes of compressed data. I mean, overall. So this is including HTML, this is including CSS, this is including JavaScript. And everything above this number is perceived as a potential performance bot bottleneck. And I'm curious, like, what do you think how the reality looks like? Because I think most of the developers have no idea about this uh, good practice, because otherwise the reality wouldn't look like this. So the real average asset size is almost two megabytes. So no 170 kilobytes, but two megabytes. And these numbers are really, really bad. They're so bad, I don't even know where to start. And especially if you compare the mobile and desktop ones, because they are almost identical, which means that actually no one is optimizing for mobile. So the worst thing about this is that we are talking about the transfer size, which means it's a compressed data. And almost one fourth of that is JavaScript. So we are shipping half of megabyte of compressed JavaScript, compressed again. So you don't even want to know how long it will take to execute this code on a low end phone. Actually, I will have a diagram very soon. So we will see how long it will take. Our download is on, you know, 3G network. So big JavaScript bundles contribute to less consistent performance across devices. In fact, for mobile commerce, and that will be surprising, network is rarely a bottleneck these days, but computing power is. So if you look closely at this diagram, you will see that the parsing time could be even 100 times longer on lower devices than on uh, desktop devices or laptops. So your JavaScript heavy website could load even 30 or 40 seconds, really, on mid-range phones. And this is like reality. This is what's happening. But we are all testing our software on MacBooks. We are all testing our software on the latest iPhones. And we are not thinking about the other users. Our majority of users doesn't have this high-end phones. So unless your audience is actually uh, targeted as luxury, and you are pretty sure that they are using only the latest and fastest flagship phones, you should definitely optimize your JavaScript bundles also in terms of computing power. Uh, OK, so now we know that there is a problem. We know that we ship far, far, far too much JavaScript. So how we are making sure it will not happen in the storefront? So do you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I was saying that if you will follow the best practices, you can expect great performance. So here is a great example that this is actually working. So before I show you what we did, I want to quickly get through different types of features we have in our e-commerce applications. Uh, in that case, we storefront one. So of course, we have e-commerce and CMS integrations, and they are the ones that contribute the most to the overall bundle size of our application. They also have their extensions, which are in many cases also integrations with different third parties by themselves, uh, with their own SDKs, which also wave a lot. Next, we have a general shop business logic. So this is not tied to any specific integration. Uh, we also have a UI logic, mostly in view, like components and some UI libraries. And we also have a lot of data transformations, as we want our code to be the same for every e-commerce backend. Uh, so in that case, we are making it agnostic. And we also have numerous packages related to GraphQL and Apollo. And you know all of that was initially on the front end, like it is in most SPAs out there. And this is how it should look like. And basically, this is exactly what we did. So we moved everything that was not mandatory for the UI layer to the server, because front end should be just about the UI. And data should come from the server, right? So why we are <coughs> making so many heavily computing operations on the front end? Uh, and this not only contributed to much smaller bundle size, but also let us cache the result of the computations on the server side. 
So this, in some cases, can give you much bigger performance benefits than the bundle size optimization themselves. Uh, but wait, like Apollo and queries. So we have a lot of regular optimizations, but we also have a few, I would say, like dirty hacks. Uh, <clears throat> and this is one of them. So when I was analyzing our bundle to see what we can potentially move to the server, I noticed that a huge part of it was related to GraphQL, actually this part. Uh, and you know, I started to wonder if we are even using GraphQL Apollo in a way that can justify its impact on the JavaScript bundle size. And the answer was no. So did we resign from GraphQL then? No, also no, this is super cool. Uh, we haven't resigned actually from any feature. So fasten your seatbelts uh, because this is actually what we ended up with. So let me explain what happens there by showing you an example of fetching the product. So on the front end, we're calling get product from a composable, like when we are invoking a search method, you remember it's calling get product uh, under the hood. And we are sending this a regular REST API call. Uh, we can also pass an alternative GraphQL query name uh, or leave this field empty and just use the default one that is on the server. So the get product function is performing a REST call to our server middleware where we move most of our business logic. In the body of the REST call, we are passing function parameters and optionally a custom GraphQL query. And assuming and like, like assuming we haven't passed any custom query, you know, we're just using this default one, uh, passing into integration SDK, which under the hood is using Apollo. So we are sending a REST request from the front end to the middleware, and the middleware is performing the GraphQL request uh, to the platform. So this is kind of like we have a cake and eat the cake at the same time, uh, because we're saving a lot of bundle size reserved for Apollo and GraphQL on the front end while still making use of it. Uh, a lot of steps to perform a single request, you could say, of course, but all of this is under the hood. And, you know, we not only don't have to put all the code making this work on the client, but we can also effectively cache the response of this code. So it doesn't even have to run, uh, which saves a lot of computing power. And as we have seen, uh, this also contributes to more consistent performance across different devices, which is especially beneficial for low-end phones. And I, I told you that we have saved, saved a lot of space and there was a lot to save because this part uh, that we have moved to the server was taking 88 kilobytes gzipped which is more than a half of your performance budget, if you remember, 170 kilobytes, uh, if you want to follow best practices. So this is just for one integration. In that case, uh, it was Commerce Tools. For those who don't know what Commerce Tools is, it's uh, an enterprise e-commerce platform, actually a very good one. So this is only for a single platform. And in a regular application, in a real world application, we have much more than that. You will have a dedicated SDK for CMS. You will have a dedicated SDK for search and much more. Uh, so it could be even 400 kilobytes of uh, JavaScript saved. Like the bigger application you have actually, the more you save, save by using this pattern. Uh, so like utilize your server set code as much as you can. And this is really like the best thing you can do for your app's performance. Uh, so in the end, your view storefront application will look like this majority of the code will be on the server side, so it doesn't affect front end performance and can be effectively cached. And by introducing middleware, we managed to remove almost half of the front end code. And you know, the more complex project is, the bigger the savings will be. Uh, okay, so how can you work with this awesome shiny thing uh, called Visorfront middleware? And this is actually super simple. You can configure all your integrations in middleware config, which is looking like this. So whenever you want to install a new one, you're just installing a package, configuring it in a middleware config. And each integration can be configured and extended, as you can see here. So we're, we're just putting the names of the integrations in the integration subject, like Shopify, Storyblock, Algolia. All of them have the same config. and Let's take a deeper look at the extensions because you're most likely want to extend your integrations in your project. Uh, and the accessibility system here is pretty powerful. So here we have a function that is basically taking the ar uh, array of the integrations 
uh, of the extensions. So if there are any uh, pre-installed ones, we can easily get rid of them by removing them from array, or we can push to the array new integrations uh, and return them. And how the integration look like? So more or less like this. So in case we want to overwrite API client methods or create a new one, we can use extend API methods property. If we put there a function with the same name as already existing one, it will also override it. So if you have a get product and we'll put a get product function, it will override it. If we create a new function, it will also be available. Uh, there is also something called hooks. So as the name suggests, they are allowing us to hook into different parts of the integration lifecycle. So what we can do, we can change the initial con integration config. So you have seen that uh, here we have configuration. So we can change the initial integration configuration before it's being instantiated or at after create, we can do something after the initialization. So we can, we can also hook into each function call. So whenever we are uh, calling get product, get category, any other function from API client, we can also hook into those functions. So we can hook into in initialization and functions. And it works exactly the same. So we can hook into before call, we have access to configuration, we have access to the arguments of the call, and we can hook into after call uh, to react into some call and, for example, collect some analytics. And you're seeing an unreleased feature, by the way. So this is coming uh, in vSurf on 2.3, which is a final version of vSurf on Next that is coming this month. And you know we want to celebrate uh, the launch of the final version of vSurf on Next by organizing a huge event in April. Uh, so you will learn about vSurf front, available integrations, hear success stories from our customers, hang out with the core team and you know it's free it's open from whole we store front community so sign up today to not miss uh that will be like the final date when we are releasing uh the whole we store front next and we are super super excited about this and okay so i made myself a backdoor <laughs> to not show the demo if i don't have time but i think i still have like one minute so maybe i will i will show you quickly like in a minute how the real world uh Vista Front Next project look like. Or maybe I can't. I can. Okay, so for some reason I can't. Uh, but we still have four minutes for the QA. So thank you very much. And you can check what I was talking about today uh, at docs.vsurfrom.io. They are still work in progress. We are working on finishing this documentation this month. But also, if something in the documentation will be not clear for you, it's a great way uh, and a great occasion to actually contribute. And of course, leave a start if you like the project. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Uh, it has been a great session by you. And we saw the roadmaps of the new storefront. And uh, hey, community, be excited. Uh, you can use View Storefront with various upcoming uh, all the great uh, technologies around e-commerce. Uh, most of the e-commerce platforms are able to connect to View Storefront effectively. Be there in VSF uh, uh, Summit, uh, which Philip has mentioned in April 20. Thank you, guys. And stay tuned. We will have uh, GSA coming in next. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for a great, wonderful session. Thank you. Thanks for...